Okay, so welcome everyone to the afternoon section of this our Ellen White Issues Symposium, our virtual event today. Um, we are very happy uh, that you are joining us again. Um, and uh, after enjoying a very good uh, section with several presentations in the morning, we are starting now uh, with more good quality presentations. Um, hopefully you had a good lunch and are ready to just um, enjoy and uh, looking forward as well to uh, towards the end, have a panel discussion. So don't forget to uh, submit your questions uh, through the chat here with the Q&A um, feature. And um, once you submit your questions there, they will be um, very possibly addressed at the last panel discussion. So just so you know, if you are new to our symposium just now, if you just joined for the afternoon, even if you submit your questions now, uh, there is someone that is keeping an eye on those and eventually they will be addressed, uh, hopefully, uh, at the panel discussion, which happens at 4 p.m. Uh, so uh, let me introduce you now to the speakers of the hour. Uh, we are going to have a presentation now by uh, Dr. Abner Hernandez and David Sierraba. Uh, this doesn't happen too often, but it's very uh, nice that they are doing this presentation together. So collaborating with interdisciplinary studies. Uh, Dr. Abner Hernandez is an assistant professor of church history in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary here at Andrews. He's originally from Cuba and has served the church as pastor, professor, and associate dean uh, both in Cuba and Mexico. He's co-editor of the recently published book entitled Enseñanzas Bíblicas de la Fe Adventista, uh, which in English would be uh, something like Biblical Teachings of the Adventist Faith. Um, on the other hand, Professor Davide Sierrava is a PhD candidate here, uh, assistant professor at the religious, uh, uh, religion department of Andrews University. He is also um, originally from Italy and has served the church as chaplain, professor, youth pastor, and senior pastor in Italy, France, and Spain. He is finishing his doctoral dissertation in systematic theology um, and ethics as well at the Theological uh, Seminary of Andrews University. Their presentation today is entitled, A Temple for the Creator to Abide, the Soul Sanctuary in Ellen G. White's Writings. We will be also joined by Corey Wetterlin. He is um, Assistant Professor of Religion at Kettering College in Kettering, Ohio. Eventually, he's going to be the respondent. But for now, um, Dr. Abner Hernandez and Professor David Sierraba, the time is yours. And the presentation will, you will have 30 minutes to present. So we are looking at perhaps uh, finishing um, around 2, 2.03, around that time. Uh, so the time is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Irian, for your nice introduction to our paper and to our persons this afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to express my gratitude to the Hawaii State of the General Conference and to the Center for Adventist Research and the Church History Department in our seminary here in Andrews University for the opportunity to present our research on LNG Hawaii in this important venue. Um, Davide and I have been working on this idea for several years now. And we have presented some part of these ideas in other venues in the chairs, and they have been well received. But I think this is an special way to present our mature ideas and to grow and learn more and to be corrected this afternoon in this important um, in this important event. So the title of our first paper is a temple for the creator to abide the soul sanctuary in LNG White writings. In volume three of his systematic theology, creation, Christ and salvation, 
normal godly contrast the word of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary with the work of the Holy Spirit in the sanctuary of the soul. It is far more important to focus on what Christ is doing in the heavenly in the in the sanctuary of heaven than what the Spirit is doing inside a Christian life. For what happens within is the fruit of what happens in heaven, says Gali. Gali's concern seems understandable because he intends to emphasize the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary in contrast to the spiritualization supported by Richard Foster. Unlike Gali, Foster only considers the Holy Spirit work in the inner sanctuary of the heart without considering Christ's priestly ministry in a special temporal temple in heaven. However, some pioneer, Adventist pioneers did not necessarily find a tension between both perspectives in their theological conceptualization of the sanctuary doctrine. They, including Ellen G. White, understood both the word of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and the work of the spirit in the sanctuary of the soul as a unified experience in the divine task of redemption. It is not a matter of either the heavenly sanctuary or the soul temple, but both realities for the pioneers. This study primary pur purpose is to explore the concept of the purification of the soul temple in the context of the purification of the heavenly sanctuary in Ellen G. White's writings. To highlight this idea in its historical doctrinal context, we will need to have a brief insight into this perspective among the Adventist pioneers who preceded Ellen G. White. The study finishes providing historical and biblical support for this concept and outlines some theological and spiritual implications for the present. The sanctuary of the soul in the pioneers. The concept of a unified experience between the world of the heavenly sanctuary and the world of the uh, temple of the soul appear in early Adventist theological treatises. Crozier, a key figure in the conceptualization of the sanctuary doctrine, wrote to Enoch Jacobs calling his attention to the word of the Holy Spirit as the one who ministered in the sanctuary of the soul to purify it. Similarly, Christ ministered in the heavenly sanctuary purification, preparing it as a dwelling place for the saved. Crozier explains, many seem not to have discovered that there is a literal temple and a spiritual temple. The literal is the sanctuary in the New Jerusalem, a literal city, and the spiritual, the church. The literal occupied by Christ Jesus, our King and Priest, the spiritual by the Holy Spirit. Between these two, there is a perfect harmony of action while Christ prepared prepare the place, the heavenly sanctuary, the Spirit prepares the people, the soul temple, when he came, when, when he came to his temple, the sanctuary to purify it, to cleanse it, the Spirit commands the peace, special cleansing of the people. Crozier pointed to the existence of two temples, two agents, and two words of purification that concur as a unified experience. Consequently, Crozier does not see a tension between the identification of the sanctuary as the church, or more specifically, the believer's souls, and the heavenly spatial temporal sanctuary. In his opinion, only purified believers can enter and dwell in a purified sanctuary. However, Crozier's perspective was not a novel since William Miller had previously identified the church, both individually and corporatively, as the sanctuary of God. The Christian community and the believer's soul were also in need of cleansing and justification according to what Daniel 8.14 prophesied. When, we the, when, when will the saints be cleansed and justified as Miller? He replies, when our Lord shall come, the whole church will then be cleansed for all uncleanness and presented without a spot and wrinkle and will then be clothed with fine linen, clean and white. We should know that Miller correlates the cleansing of the earth and the saints of two events that will take place together at the time of the Lord's second coming. As we have indicated, Crozier and the pioneers did not abandon this correlation of events. Still, they only changed the identity of the sanctuary from the earth into a literal temple in heaven. Not everyone among the first Adventist pioneers 
accept the spiritual perspectives of the sanctuary as a reality within the human being. For example, Joseph Bates found that the interpretation that identifies the believer as the sanctuary was a speculation and spiritualization. In such a view, the interpreter doesn't carefully follow the patterns and types of biblical teaching. However, when careful theological reflection preserves the reality of the heavenly sanctuary and its purification for the ministry of Christ, Bate was willing to admit that the believer's soul should also experience a purification process in harmony with what is happening in the heavenly dimension. Therefore, Bates argues, the sanctuary must be cleansed, made holy, and also the saints, because the apostle John says, nothing impure and impious will enter there. Unlike Crozier, Bates does not directly correlate the purification of the soul and the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary because he carefully avoids referring to the human soul as a sanctuary. However, he was willing to admit that the believer's soul was also in need of purification. The vast majority of the pioneers of this era preserved this attitude. For example, Uriah Smith vehemently deny any identification of the sanctuary with the church of the individual believers. He specified that the third chair refers to the believers and the sanctuary refers to a physical place of worship, in this context, the heavenly sanctuary. However, the new emphasis on righteousness by faith and the work of Christ in the life of the believers after 1888 propitiated a safe theological harbor to refer to the concept of the sanctuary of the soul or the soul temple. In 1892, Jones wrote that one must empty the soul temple of, or empty the soul temple of everything defilement and let the spirit of God take full possession of the heart that the character may be transformed. For illustrating his concept, Jones built an interesting connection between the temple of the soul and the Israelite earthly sanctuary. He claimed that the entire system of services of the sanctuary given to Israel was intended to show that God not only dwelt in the physical temple, but also he did in the temple of the heart, the sanctuary of the soul. So the sanctuary was in fact a vivid representation of what God was doing in the human soul. For John's such connection and integration of the present and word of Christ as officiating priest in the sanctuary of the soul must also be preserved in the antitypical reality of the heavenly sanctuary. That is, John explains, is the believers in the new covenant understand the meaning of all types of truth about the heavenly sanctuary and is not able to see or know Christ in that in our own personal experience, then there is no difference with what happened to the Jews who failed to connect the cleansing and work of the early sanctuary with the spiritual real reality of salvation of their souls. John suggested that spiritual purification is not just something in the physical and literal sanctuary, but be it the Old Testament tabernacle or the heavenly temple. For the purification to be sufficient for salvation of the soul, we must understand that it is an experience that happens in our life themselves. Ellen G. White, the temple of the soul. At the same time that Jones presented his perspective, Ellen G. White began using the concept of the soul temple and the sanctuary of the soul. Through previously, she has referred to the concept of sanctification as a cleansing of the heart. The analogy between the soul, the temple, or sanctuary became more prominent, prominent in her writings and even more central than in any of her collaborators. It is important to begin exploring this concept by showing that God's ideal, according to Huai, was always making his creatures the temple of his dwelling place. From the eternal, I quote, ages, it was God's purpose that every created being for the radiant and holy seraphim until the human being should be a temple for the creator to abide. Unfortunately, since ruining the divine ideal and human beings dispossessed of righteousness ceased to be a temple for God. For white, 
The incarnation of Christ represented the fulfillment of the divine ideal and consequently the solution of the problem of sin. For the incarna incarnation event, God dwells in humanity and through saving grace, the heart of man becomes again his temple. On this fundamental premise, why presented the purification of the sanctuary of the soul in connection to different aspects of the Christian life? The purification of the soul is an urgent need in preparation for the mission, witnessing, Adventist lifestyle, and character development, and even for the social responsibilities of God's people. For example, in the context of character development, why is the Christ is the source from which would flow forth love and compassion, cleansing the soul temple, and making men like him in character. Scatologically, she drew attention to only those who enjoys the cleansing of the temple of the soul and who may remain in the investigative judgment, judgment and inherit the kingdom of God. He will not take up his above with us until the soul temple has been emptied and cleansed. This quote stone is present in the vast majority of white conceptualization of the soul's sanctuary. Now, why did not just use the concept of the sanctuary of the soul as an spiritual incentive and an analogy of the process of sanctification? Besides, why makes clear allusions to the cleansing of the sanctuary of the soul as an interdependent and correlative work that is a unified experience to the purification of the heavenly sanctuary. Eradicating the sins of the heavenly sanctuary would have no significant impact on believers' life and their eternal destiny is seems are not first cast out of the temple of the soul. She affirmed Christ is cleansing the heavenly sanctuary from, from the sins of the people. And it is the work of all who are laborers together with God to be cleansing the sanctuary of the soul for everything that is offensive to him. In a sermon during the general conference of 8088, she expressed, now Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary. And what is he doing? Make the atonement for us, cleanse the sanctuary from the sins of the people. Then we must enter by faith into the sanctuary with him. We must commence the work in the sanctuary of our soul. We are to cleanse ourselves from all defilement. Christ and angels work in the hearts of the children of men. There must be a purifying of the soul here upon earth in harmony with Christ's cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. We should know that why use the images and the literal language of the sanctuary? With the, within them, the human beings, she built is a spiritual analogies for the sanctuary of the soul, thus emphasizing the idea of a unified experience with, with what happens in the heavenly sanctuary. In her writings, the sanctuary of the soul also has its inner, its rooms and quarters and experiences pollution and dishonor, needs purification, and the inner chambers need to be continually illuminated by the light of the spirit. All language refers to the furniture and the literal sanctuary service. Therefore, for white, God is not only operating a great cleansing work in the heavenly sanctuary, but he also does it in the sanctuary he has erected by faith in the being of each believer. Due to the use of positive language about the human role in connection with the concept of the sanctuary of the soul, many has taken the concept out of the Christocentric and neumatological perspective to build soteriological anthropological, anthropological conceptualization centered on human power instead of the divine ability to redeem. However, a careful reading of most Ellen G. White use of this concept will reveal a focus on the po power of Christ and his grace as the agent to minister and the means that cleans the temple of the soul. In cleansing the temple of the worst buy buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission to, mission to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin. Only Christ can cleanse the soul temple. In white eyes, the grace of God is a living source of power and an always active means of, of, of cleansing. I will skip this quotation because 
the time is running. Uh, due to the implication of the main idea proposed by Huai, it is essential to establish the nature of relationship between the purification uh, work in the heavenly sanctuary and in the temple of the soul. In our opinion, Huai's conceptualization conceptualization requires a spiritual understanding of the relationship between the heavenly sanctuary and the soul of the believers. Therefore, in the contemplation of the word of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, a spiritual dimension is manifested to the believer with profound individual salvific implications. Who I express this idea as follows. When Jesus is within the sanctuary above, when we have an advocate in the course of heaven, how earnestly should the corresponding work of intercession be going on upon the earth? On the one hand, know that energy white did not abandon the conceptualization of a real uh, and a spatial, tem a spatial temporal sanctuary with literal functions in heaven, like other pioneers why preserve a typological relationship between Thai and anti Thai between the early tabernacle and the heavenly sanctuary. On the other hand, however, as we have seen, why was emphasizing the work of purification, the heavenly, why by emphasizing, sorry, the work of purification in the heavenly sanctuary does not diminish the real work of cleansing taking place in the temple of the soul. So, for why, there is also a typological relationship between the earthly tabernacle and the sanctuary of the soul, why it stays both truth in a way that maintains the necessary balance and harmony. Therefore, because why understood the word of Christ and the spirit in both reality as a unified experience with an individual and universal dimension, she found no need to define the direction of influence or the prioritization of one over the other. So instead of stating that the experience of the spiritual and internal cleansing of the soul temple is a fruit of the heavenly sanctuary purification, or that the work of the heavenly the heavenly purification is a faithful rep representation of what takes place in the soul to why it is an spiritual, analogous, interdependent, concurrent, and harmonious experience. Historical biblical support for the concept of the, the sanctuary of the soul. The concept of the sanctuary of the soul at the origin of the word of Christ and the place of the uh, at the place of dwelling of the Holy Spirit is not a theological creation of Selen Jihuai and the Adventist pioneers. They found enough biblical support to identify the human being as a spiritual temple where God dwells. It is important to know that the concept of the soul temple has also developed as a Christian spiritual motive in the theological history of the church. I will skip this part about uh, the, the biblical concept on the soul, the soul temple because uh, we are going to express more in the second paper on this topic and I will go directly to my um, connection between LNG Hawaii ideas and the previous conceptualization in the history of Christianity. To evaluate the idea of the sanctuary of the soul is critically to analyze the history of the conceptualization in Christianity. Ad Adventist pioneers, certainly, with a different understanding of the metaphysical and ontological realities to the classical theology of Christianity, added a dimension long overlooked in the Christian theological reflection, that is, the reality of a functional and literal sanctuary in heaven. But they do not necessarily abandon the Christian perspective, both neo-testamentary and post-testamentary, affirming that the human being themselves are a new sanctuary for God. The church father consistently identified the soul of, the, of each believer at the most holy place of God's new sanctuary. And you have there Irenaeus of Lyon. He says um, clearly that Christ is now in the heavenly sanctuary, but also the believer's body is the temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells and doing a 
purifying world. Similar ideas we will find in almost every instance of the theological development of the Christian church. For example, Martin Luther talked about every believer's body as the spiritual temple of God. Similar, the Anglican preacher Richard Hooker, who used the temple condition described in Haggai 1.4 as a symbol of the soul temple in need of restoration and cleansing. Closer to the historical context and biblical theological perspective of the pioneers and Ellen G. White, John Wesley identified the believer's heart as the sanctuary in need of cleansing. In the heart, Christ, quote, is and dwells, fighting against all sin to purify it according to the purification of the sanctuary. And you, you later on can read these quotations. Undoubtedly, Wesley evoked the purification images of the ancient tabernacle and applied them to the cleansing of the believer's soul. Similar perceptions we will find both in Ellen G. White as in the thinkers of the holiness movement in the Second Great Awakening context, for instance, Phoebe Palmer. The Adventist conceptualization of the sanctuary as a functional literal reality in heaven and functional spiritual experience in the human being invites us to consider the significant theological implication of this perspective. Surely, there exists way in which this concept can be misunderstood, contrary to the biblical framework in which Ellen G. White developed it. Although it is possible to misuse a genuine idea, that is not a sufficient motive to reject it. We understand that there are, there are valuable spiritual and theological ideas in understanding the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary and the sanctuary of the soul as a unified, harmonious, and analogous experiences. First, the concept of the temple of the soul offers a broader critical understanding of the sanctuary doctrine. We should ask one question when considering the sanctuary doctrine. What is the nation and function of the sanctuary? The Bible tells us that the sanctuary is where God dwells, governs, and ministers in favor of his people. As for the purpose of the sanctuary, it is a tangible manifestation that God decides to live among his people to establish intimate relationships with them. In the first sanctuary in the Garden of Eden, in the altar of the stone, in the tabernacle in the desert, in the magnificent temple of Solomon, and in the sanctuary of the human heart, God always seeks to meet human beings to dwell in their midst. Consequently, the scriptural images of God dwelling in the sanctuary convey the idea of restore an harmonious relationship between God and his creature. The restored relationship becomes a reality in the individual level by the cleansing of the sanctuary of the soul and in the universal level by the purification of the heavenly sanctuary. Revelation 21.3, alluding Exodus 25.8, speaks about the fulfillment of this hope by describing the total restoration and restitution of perfect harmony when a heavenly voice announced, here among human beings, there is the above of God. He will come in the middle of them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Second, the idea about the temple of the soul contains the potential to exalt the power of the atoning sacrifice on the cross. It is even possible to suggest that it can provide the necessary balance between the complete atonement on the cross that will be completed in the pre-advent judgment in the heavenly sanctuary. The concept of the sanctuary of the soul emphasizes the daily work of salvation that Christ works through his blood in human beings. Therefore, it speaks of atonement and forgiveness of sin that is complete, sufficient, and perfect in Christ. At the same time, it is continuous and growing in the Christian experience salvation, uh, sanctification. In short, when speaking of the sanctuary, the purification of the sanctuary of soul temple, he emphasizes individual salvation in the forgiveness and cleansing of sin and the assurance of salvation. On the other hand, the concept of the purification of the heavenly sanctuary emphasizes the final eradication of sin in the universe. 
At, at that time, the atonement of Christ and the merits of the cross reaches its climax and final fulfillment. God's justice is made manifest to all heavenly beings and all human creatures. Therefore, when discussing the work of the heavenly sanctuary, the culmination is emphasized as eschatological, the final judgment of God and the consummation of divine mysteries. Finally, the concept of the sanctuary of the soul can possibly be perceived as an spiritualization of the, the sanctuary doctrine. We are very aware, aware of that. Although for our perspective, we are not in the presence of mystification or spiritualization, but of a spiritual and typological understanding of the sanctuary of the soul. In that context, it is essentially to recognize that we benefit from making the purification teaching of the heavenly sanctuary more experiential in the life of the believer. This is possible because it makes a logical connection, doctrinal and spiritual, between both realities, the heavenly and the experience of the tangible Christian life here and now. Christian doctrines work not only as knowledge to be accepted intellectually, but more importantly, as principle of life and practice to be experienced. When this integration and internalization of the doctrines fail, the doctrines themselves can undoubtedly maintain their integrity, truthfulness, consistency, and conceptual coherence. However, believers face the risk of losing interest in them and find them irrelevant as they fail to discover meaning for their daily experiences, real struggles, and the missional purpose of life, both personal and communal. In our understanding, the concept of sanctuary of the soul adds individual, experiential, and spiritual dimension to the purification of the heavenly sanctuary. As says the prophet Isaiah, God dwells in a holy and sublime place, heavenly sanctuary, but also with the contrite and humble spirit, the sanctuary of the soul. Conclusion. First, we have tried to analytically underline the sanctuary image of the soul as Ellen G. White contextual, conceptualized it to present some positive theological implication of this concept for the Seventh-day Adventist faith community today. As we have posited out, uh, pointed out, White developed this concept of the temple of the soul taken from some pioneers that preceded her and carefully integrated the same in the doctrinal theological framework of the Adventist movement. In other words, in advancing a reading about the spiritual unifying and harmonious relationship of the early sanctuary as an image that points to the sanctuary of the soul, why did not deny the antitypical relationship between the tabernacle and the reality of the spatial temporal sanctuary in heaven? Is our reading is correct? Why may a significant theological contribution to the Christian thought? We have pointed out that the integration of the concept of the cleansing of the temple of the soul with the atoning and purifying word of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary possesses rich theological and spiritual implication for the sanctuary doctrine. Some of this implication has more of a holistic understanding of the doctrine in the context of restored relationships, a more comprehensive vision of the atonement and the experiential contribution that the idea entails has been presented. However, that does not close the possibility of exploring this idea more deeply from both, from the biblical perspective, as from the, from the writings of Selen Why to find new doctrinal implications and practices. To this, we must add the need for future study to discover how the idea of the sanctuary of the soul was received, understood, modified, and even rejected by the generation of Adventist thinkers who succeeded Ellen G. White. Finally, the concept of the soul temple calls to integrate our theological concept into life and to continually restore the relationship with God who seeks us invites us and decides to dwell with us. As Jesus said, the kingdom of God is in you. God bless you and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Hernandez for such a good presentation. And now uh, we have for the next uh, perhaps 10 to 15 minutes, 
uh, a response by Dr. Wetterlin, Corey Wetterlin. Again, he is assistant professor of religion at Kettering College in Kettering, Ohio. So uh, Corey, uh, Dr. Wetterlin, the time is yours. Thank you, Ariane. Um, and I'd like to start the response by thanking um, Dennis and the symposium for giving me the opportunity to participate in the virtual session. It's been a bit of a strange year for all of us, but uh, there's also benefits like being able to participate from a distance. So I'm grateful for that. My response um, kind of consists of three areas. One is the affirmations that I see in the paper, which there are, are many. Um, uh, some curiosities that came up as I was reading through it that I'm just interested to know more about and could be a continued study. And then the third will be the considerations that uh, if taken in mind could could bring some strength to the paper itself. Um, so uh, due to time, um, I'm going to just go over the affirmations a little bit and uh, there's more that will get sent to you in the document uh, abner and davide i'm so glad you are working on this study i'm also going to skip the curiosities uh, and get to the concerns uh, just because of the sake of time so here we go um so beginning with the appreciation really for the holistic work uh, that has gone into this paper to bring the objective and the subjective views of the sanctuary together too often we separate our objective doctrinal understandings from subjective personal experience. In this paper, the authors have brought together the objective information regarding the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and the subjective personal experience of the work of Christ through the Holy Spirit in the soul temple of each individual believer. Uh, Ellen White, as usual, it points towards a broader perspective which encompasses both the objective heavenly work and the subjective personal work. Uh, I appreciate the emphasis also on the character development in relation to the sanctuary of the soul. Character development is very much at the center of our evidence theology when it comes to sanctification and perfection. I would also like to affirm the needed work of Christ through the agent of the Holy Spirit um, for this to be accomplished rather than it being based on human merit. Um, so moving on to Unfortunately, skipping the curiosities, moving to the considerations that can bring some strength uh, to the study, possibly. Um, I'd like to suggest first turning to the biblical and, and, and historical section. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for this part of my, con my consideration, Abner went, uh, kind of skipped over the biblical references, but hopefully in the next, the next paper, uh, as he mentioned, they'll come out. So that will be great. Um, but I want to look at some of that section. Um, the authors are attempting in, a in the biblical section to highlight the possibility of an individual heart being the, quote, center of God's presence. The first thing that I am concerned about here is that the texts that are being referenced to support the focus of the individual are more focused actually on a corporate nature of the new Christian community, so I, I just look at them briefly here, looking at the plural nature of these texts versus the singular nature of these texts. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 is the first one, uh, verses 16 through 17. Uh, do you, plural, not know that you, plural, are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you, plural? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God. God's temple is holy, and you, plural, are that temple. Now, we've often looked at that passage as referring to the plural, and then sometimes we'll move on to chapter uh, six and suggest that that's more individual. But even in this one, it has the emphasis of the plural. So this is verse 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we, plural, obviously, are the temple of the living God. And God said, I will make my dwelling among them, plural, and walk among them, plural. No, I will be their God and they shall be my pe people. Moving on even to verse 19, or do you, plural, not know that your, plural, body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, plural, whom you, plural, have from God. You, plural, are not your own, right? So we can see this emphasis of the plural nature, of the corporate nature, uh, when scripture is talking about the temple. Um, even in Ephesians 2, 
which is brought out as an example in the paper as a, a specific looking at the singular, it's talking about many different people being brought together, very many different members being brought together into that corporate experience. Um, verse 21, in whom the, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you, plural, are being put built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So I'm mentioning these things to bring bring back the, the hopes of the paper talking about that holistic nature, right? Uh, it's true that we don't only want to limit this doctrine to the objective or the subjective. We want to bring those two together. If we're thinking uh, holistically, we also need to be willing to think of ourselves and our personhood corporately, uh, not only individually. The authors do point towards both the individual and the universal application of the sanctuary, sanctuary message. This seems to, to me to be dealing with the, the macro level and the micro level, but maybe leaving out some of the meso or the middle level. Um, I wonder if this displays the Western bias of the individual as well as possibly the Adventist aversion to um, the importance of, of the corporate in order to protect us from any insinuation that salvation might come through the church or the unifying of the body of Christ through the presence of a dispensed, being dispensed within the sacramental system, right? We tend to shy away from those types of things. And sometimes we miss the corporate implications because of that. So I believe it's worth exploring. And I think of there's a lot of support there in Ellen White to look at that. Katrina Blue does some nice work with that in her dissertation. So my last area of consideration for this paper is concerning the section on the historical port support for the Soul Temple. The authors acknowledge the ontological difference um, that many of the church fathers have with Adventists regarding the nature of the heavenly sanctuary, right? Um, they don't talk as much about how the differences though that we that we have uh regarding the ontology of the soul and also the nature of indwelling of this soul by divine presence there's a mention that the author, authors are not promoting a mysticism or a spiritualism view of the sanctuary of the soul but rather a typological or spiritual one and i believe it's important to um bring this distinction out a little bit more for, for Adventists. Towards the end of the paper, there's a nudge towards the need to explore um, what later Adventists seem to, why they seem to maybe move away from the soul sanctuary language. And in the footnotes, it's suggested that maybe this has to do with the crisis over panthe panentheism with Kellogg. And I would say that's definitely true. And I would say that it's not only true for later Adventists, but for Ellen White herself. Um, Ellen White makes some important distinctions during the, uh, this time regarding the nature of the union with Christ and the indwelling of the Spirit. First, she focuses on the dwelling of the believer on the dwelling of the believer on Christ and the dwelling of Jesus in the believer by His Word, by the Word of Truth. Uh, in one of the special testimonies for ministers and work, workers, I'm just grabbing a few snippets, you can look at the fuller quote later. Um, she says, when his, meaning Jesus's words of instructions have been received and have taken possession of us. So they're really ingrained in us. And a little bit later, Jesus Christ, his spirit, his character colors everything. It is the warp and the woof of the very texture of our entire, entire being. The words of Christ are spirit and life. So, and a little bit later, continuing to look unto Jesus, we reflect his image to all around us. We cannot stop to consider our disappointments or even to talk of them, for a more pleasant picture attracts our sight, the precious love of Jesus. He dwells in us by the word of truth. So secondly, White also discourages the thought that the believers are united with the divine in person, um, with the example talking about Christ's communion with his disciples. The unity that exists between Christ and his disciples does not destroy the personality of either. They are one in purpose in mind and character, but not in person. Um, and it is thus that God and Christ are one even. So from this brief quote, there is a significant distinction made here between when considering the union with Christ, right, um, between 
the Adventist view and then the church father's view. Uh, this is a relational union more than it is an ontological one, um, which moves towards the transformation of the purpose, the mind, and the character of the soul, or rather the entire person, right? United with Christ, thinking about that holistic understanding and defining of the soul and the person. This brings me to the, to the conclusion of my response and another affirmation of the paper. The emphasis on the purpose of the sanctuary as a dwelling of God with humanity and the relational nature of that purpose is essential to how we talk about this. I once again point toward the corporate experience on the meso level as the emphasis of scripture rather than the individual. The dwelling of the tabernacle in the wilderness, the temple in Solomon's time, the New Testament church, and the coming New Jerusalem is God relationally dwelling among or in the midst of his people, his household. Every member of the household is surrendered to the purpose and the ruler of the household. This is how we can affirm the kingdom of God is in you. As we affirm the lordship of Christ in our lives and our communities, we become the household of God or the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it transforms us. The power of Christ works within to cleanse us from sin. I appreciate and affirm the holistic trajectory of this paper, bringing together the subjective and the objective, uh, the individual and the universal. I think we can continue to move in this holistic direction and bring greater meaning out of our doctrines into the lives of our believers, I, I would encourage us to think about the nature of the indwelling of the sanctuary of the soul and what this means when applied to the corporate body. When the individual, which the individual is a part of, but is by no means the whole of, nor really the scriptural focus of, uh, although it's all those individuals coming together to make that corporate body. So. Uh, that's my response. Thank you for listening, and thank you for the work you guys are doing on this. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Wetterlin, for that response. And now we want to um, open up for Dr. Hernandez uh, in case that you want to have a reply to that response. We are doing good in time, so usually you would have five minutes, but you know you can extend yourself a bit if yeah. you if you so wish. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to to say thank you to Dr. Wetterling um, uh, for taking the time to read the paper and to find the strengths and also the weaknesses in in it. Uh, so we appreciate it a lot. Your your response, and as you pointed out. Um, uh, I don't know, I, it was supposed to be 40 minutes, um, but it was announced 30 minutes, so I skipped the biblical part. But I think in the paper we made clear that most of these uh, passages we are mentioning um, uh, refers, uh, refers to the community, to the whole, the, the whole community, and not necessarily to the individual. Um, even though um, the commentaries we read, because um, uh, we, we find so, some support in the, in the commentaries. Uh, the, the passages are always possible to read them in an individual level. Um, but I, I think that we have to look again to those passages, even though I think the second paper is, is, is focused more on the biblical theological part than this one is more in the historical. Um, so thank you so much for your a response. We appreciate it. So um, God bless you. Okay, so thank you once again, Dr. Hernandez. We are uh, done with this one presentation at this time. We can take a break until uh, 2.30. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hernandez and uh, co-writer of this paper, Davide Ciaraba as well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wetterlin, for your response. And uh, we will see you at 2.30 with uh, another presentation uh, by Davide Ciaraba and Abner Hernandez entitled Heavenly or Soul Sanctuary, Some Holistic Theological and Ethical Implications. So see you at 2.30 and don't forget that you can keep submitting your questions. See you soon, bye-bye. <laughs>